everybody. I'm Kyle Ellicott, your host for another edition of VCTV. Welcome back. And to those that are first joining us, welcome. This is a show that we host here daily, online, live streamed to the world. We host this show with investors and thought leaders from around the world to come straight into your screen to share what's going on in various industries, topics, technologies, and regions around the world. Why is this important? It's important for everyone to know what's happening in these spaces, but also where are the opportunities? Whether you're an investor or an entrepreneur, this is the show VCTV for you. Now, today we do, we're going to be talking about two very important subjects. Now, usually on each episode, we talk about one or two different technologies. Today's very, very important. Why is that? Because we're going to be talking about bio and med tech, or if you want to call it health tech. These are very, very impacted industries and things that have been worked on for many, many years as we have been building and innovating in these spaces. But now more than ever, there's a lot happening and pushing the bounds as to where these industries have grown. We've talked previously about what's happened in biotech, some of the advancements, whether it be in food, whether it be in ourselves, looking at things like genomics or genomes to looking to how our, the future of our food will be built and pharmaceuticals to then med tech and looking at hardware and software and even the infrastructure of where things are going from a medical side as well. Now, we've brought together four great investors. We may have one more that joins, we'll see, but nonetheless, we've got four great investors who have a lot of expertise in this and the overlapping technologies. Again, why is this important? We're seeing a huge digitization of all industries globally right now. What does that mean for you? Well, for those who haven't tuned in, the technologies that we work and build in on a daily basis, whether that be artificial intelligence, AR, VR, blockchain, Internet of Things, everything in between, they all now play a role in these big industries. So we're going to break that down. We're going to talk about where the investments are going, where they're not, what's been impacted also get into the investment process, thinking about diligence, thinking about making investments. So stay tuned. We've got a great show for you. Now, again, audience, thank you for joining. If you like what you heard, click subscribe, give us a thumbs up. If you'd like to be on the show as an investor to share your thoughts, reach out. We'd love to hear from you and we'd love to host either on a show like today or on a very uh, ver variety of topics that we speak on here on daily at BCTV. And a big shout out to Elena and to the entire LA Token team for making VCTV possible on your screen, your device, anywhere in the world. Now, let's get started. Let's welcome all of our judges, or excuse me, investors today. No startups pitching, so all of our investors uh, today. Uh, let's go and start with Noble. Noble, welcome back to the show. Uh, a little intro, a little background on yourself. Yeah. Hey, Kyle. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Noble Dracone. I'm the author of the books, Winning the Trading Game and Trade Like a Pro. And I also run uh, Dracone Capital Partners. Uh, we've been in the, I guess, startup space, pre-seed space, uh, going on, on and off for about five or six years uh, in the current iteration. And our focus is really in augmented reality and virtual reality. And uh, you know, we, we really uh, love gaming. We like the idea of med tech and how it intersects with AR and VR. And uh, yeah, so I'm just excited to be here. Thanks for having me, Kyle. Absolutely. There's so much happening. I mean, if, if people haven't been paying attention to this space on the AR VR side and not to take away from Noble, but there's been some huge, huge headlines in this space around telemedicine, around remote surgeries or virtual surgeries that have happened. These are not just headlines futuristically. These are things that have happened, whether it be, I think it's mostly spinal uh, surgeries that we've seen talked about. So Noble, get ready. I can't wait to talk more about that. William. First time guest on, on my show here on VCTV. I'm very excited uh, to welcome you. And I know you've got a ton of experience in the space as well, but in a little introduction, a little background uh, on yourself as well. Yeah, of course. Um, my name is uh, Guillaume Serra. I'm a medical doctor and also mathematician. And I founded two companies in the med tech sector, uh, tel uh, two telehealth companies. Uh, and also, uh, I, I think I have 15 years of experience in the medtech sector and uh, also invested in several companies as a business angel, uh, not specifically in the health tech sector. I usually invest in what I don't work to, 
on. So it's, I typically invest in a lot of other sectors like uh, uh, renting to insurance and other, or, uh, other specific sectors. So this is more or less my experience. And I am happy to join you, Kyle, on this uh, event. We're happy to have you. And, and uh, next up, I want to welcome one of my other new co-hosts. So this is usually Elena and I. Uh, we've got Noble and Gary, my two new co-hosts, um, who have been joining us on several episodes because of their vast experience in these overlapping technologies. So you're going to hear about one of our favorite subjects here, what is also known as the new electricity, but I'll let him tee that up. Gary Fowler, welcome back to the show. A little intro, a little background on yourself as well. Oh, you're unmuted, my friend. You're right, Kyle. AI is the new electricity. I like it when I don't even have to say it anymore. There you go. AI is the new <laughs> electricity and get guess. shit done. That's right. <laughs> Fantastic. So my name's Gary Fowler, and I'm a serial entrepreneur and investor. I've been actually doing startups for 35 years. Uh, I've done 15 companies. My largest company, I was on the original management team at Click Software, actually named the company. And we sold it uh, in August of last year. It was sold for $1.35 billion. Uh, I started Eva.ai, one of the top 10 AI HR companies, four years ago. And that company is uh, actually, we were talking about a couple of days ago, our business from the beginning of COVID is up 38 times. We do remote workforce management using artificial intelligence. And the billionaire, Dr. David Yang, is my partner. So wow. I love uh, technologies. GST, as Kyle said, is Get Shit Done Venture Studios. And that's my uh, venture studio. We curate the top AI companies from around the world. And we take operational roles in those companies. And our goal is to create billion dollar companies. Literally create it. We've done them. We've done NASDAQs and IPO, uh, NASDAQ I, uh, IPOs. We've done exits. I mean, we just push it forward. We have an incredible team that really jumps in. And I say it's like, you know, you got a Ferrari. We bring a driver. We bring a turbocharger. We bring in a fantastic pit crew and bolt it in and take off with it. I love it. I can't help, help but to think about Fast and the Furious. Like, you you are the nitrous putting into my my little Hyundai ready to go. I uh, I love it, Gary. And it's true. I mean, he definitely gets shit done. And AI is the new electricity. So get ready to talk a little bit about how artificial intelligence is playing a role in this space. So investors and entrepreneurs, get ready to hear more about this. Last but not least, our surprise guest who joined just moments ago, uh, who is brilliant among many in his field, as I tee him up for a very big introduction. So he'll, he will live up to the hype. Justin, welcome to the show. Very first time guest as well. We're two for two. Great. Welcome to the uh, show, little intro and background. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. Uh, really appreciate it and happy to be here. Um, so I actually have a PhD in chemistry, which is kind of where I got most of my exposure and built the, uh, that side of my world in the kind of bio and med tech worlds. Um, after I finished that, however, I went straight into technology, just full on technology. A lot of the startups um, uh, kind of in the Austin, Texas area. And I've built a bunch of software companies over the last few years um, and recently been really focused both around the cryptocurrency space and then around FinTech in general, um, kind of FinTech up until about 2014 and then dove full on into the crypto space uh, and now starting to explore more intersections um, around just um, all kinds of um, like making investments in capital markets and um, med tech and like just watching what the frontiers look like because we've really seen frontiers blow open in the last few years in a number of areas um, that's been really surprising to watch and a really different experience I think. Absolutely. I want to touch on something before we get into the, the big ar overarching topics today is frontier. So this term has been tossed around a little bit uh, here and there. How do you, Justin, define frontier technologies uh, just to help set the stage as uh, our, our listeners may be tuning in for the first time, not necessarily hearing that term because uh, there's a lot to unpack there. So go ahead. Yeah, one, um, one kind of easy rubric there is how regulated it is. 
Um, you know, like we've seen like industries will get established, set up, and then regulation comes in, solidifies, kind of ossifies the entire system. And we see a bunch of big, big players get built up. Um, and then things will start to sort of stagnate until there's some kind of a big disruption. And so then you can start to see an industry, you know, kind of bloom, grow, you know, crystallize um, essentially and then get disrupted. And now it's a frontier technology again. And so I think that that's what we're starting to see kind of like second or third wave frontiers in things that we thought were pretty well settled. I love it. Well, with that being said, let's jump into this next frontier. Little, little trekky reference, but nonetheless, let's jump into it because this is, um, I, would, I would say Justin, to Justin's point, this is a big leap forward. This is the next generation that we're looking at in terms of technology and not just ourselves, but again, how this may impact uh, all that we do in many areas of our life, whether it be around longevity, whether it be around our food or other areas, bio and med tech. Um, what's happening? And I, you know, usually on this show, we've been talking about future forward and we're going to come back to that. But you know, what's happened in the past seven months, six, seven months around the world really has impacted these industries greatly. Um, some of them have been very slow to move traditionally. Uh, and now in the past uh, six to seven months, things have gotten aggressively faster. These industries have opened up. You're seeing more, uh, not necessarily tightening of reg uh, regulations, but instead you're starting to see more openness around collaboration. How do we get things to market? How do we do more? How do we push those bounds of of innovation and William, I want to start with you. I mean, you're you're you've been in this the medical space um, with over 15 years of experience, as you mentioned. You're running meetings, meeting doctors. I'm sure you're talking with people all about this all the time. What is really the impact that uh, you know the pandemic had on these areas that led us not to where we are today, but pushing this bound forward pretty aggressively? I, I can also, I have a lot of experience in, in especially in the telemedicine sector. So and I can relate a lot because I have uh, two companies specifically in this in this in this area. Uh, one uh, very focused in B two B and the other one very focused in B two C. It's called Medic One Meeting Doctors. One of uh, I could say uh, we we uh, anyone can can look at for example Teladoc. Everyone knows Teladoc. It's one of the biggest ones. Uh, uh, Teladoc increased 100% of the, the evaluation in the last uh, four months. But if we see, for example, all the data, not, uh, uh, and after that, I will go with my, my personal experience. You can see Pingangu Doctor. You can see my doc. You can see a lot of uh, health tech startups, telehealth startups, and they increased between 200% to 800% daily active users, new users, new customers, uh, me uh, online medical consultations in only two, three or four uh, weeks. For us, for example, uh, we, I had the data here. Um, we used to do about between 5,000 and, and 6,000 medical consultations per day. It's, it's a lot for us. It's more than a, a typical, uh, the biggest hospital in Spain. We are in Spain and Latin America, basically. In, in, in two weeks, we pass from 5,000 to 15,000 medical consultations per day, between 15,000 and 20,000. We had to hire more than 30 doctors in one week. So it was, for us, it was a 200 increase in online medical consultations, but also in new clients, we increased we, uh, with a factor of seven. We multiplied mm -hmm. per, per seven the number of new clients in only between uh, January to May. So what's, that's my experience that uh, it was coronavirus for telemedicine has, uh, has been a, a, one of the most, I think, a great impact in our sector. And I think that uh, it will keep going. We have, for example, another data that I have uh, just recently. Uh, last, this month, I have a, a 22 decrease of uh, new consultations. So it is decreasing somewhat, but uh, it is much more than we had before, much, much more. So 
I believe, I strongly believe that it's something that we will keep, it is a change of paradigm. Not all the consultations will be online, but after one year or two years, we will see that 20, 30% of medical consultation most probably will be online. Wow. That's a, that's a pretty, pretty big, impactful number. I mean, especially going from five to 15,000. Uh, I mean, you're tripling what you guys were seeing before. That scale is just uh, enormous uh, in so many ways. Justin, I see, see you're shaking your, oh, I see you're shaking your head over there. Uh, what, what have you seen as, your, as the impact uh, that the past six months have really had on these industries, you know, furthering uh, Gwilliam's point? So yeah, to his, um, so there's obviously demand, right? So we've seen just an outrageous demand. Um, and we've also seen people being willing to take risks in a very, um, in a very gratifying way, both regulators being able to like take a little bit more risk. And some of these companies are, are acting more like startups instead of big health insurance companies, you know, move fast and break things is horrifying in so many ways <laughs> around uh, healthcare and um, health technology and all that, but you do have to move, you know, and I think a lot, little bit of that got lost, um, you know, over the last 15 years and we've been tracking and I've been working with um, companies in that telemedicine space for, over five years and there's just not really demand uh, or there hadn't been demand um, but the technology was getting better and better and slow and steady growth and you know getting to 5,000 customers or you know consultations a, a week or a day whatever that you said there um, like that's huge but it took years right and then all of a sudden just an explosion so uh, it is has been very very catalytic um, in a way that I think uh, it was hard to anticipate but it's still the same, but the secular trends stay in place. It just mm -hmm. turned up, <laughs> which is fun. Yeah, and, and what's what's fascinating too, and, and Gary and Noble, I'm coming to you on this next. And William, what's fascinating of, of what you mentioned is, you know, early days of telemedicine, this was actually something that was looked at for emerging markets um, and, and not necessarily that was gonna be, you know, impactful in, in kind of established uh, regions. And, and now to, to both yours and Justin's point, we we've seen that not necessarily flip, but just ex accelerated everywhere, right? Yeah. Whether it be emerging markets or it be in established markets, doesn't doesn't matter. Uh, it's just people want this or people need this, and whether that was a condition or not, uh, that accelerant, that digitization, as we've talked about, Gary and Noble on previous shows, that digitization just said, "Get out of my way, we're coming, yeah. like we're we're in this." One of the things that I've seen a lot, it's not only about demand, it has increased a lot, the demand, but also the supply side have mm -hmm. changed a lot. The, um, they, ha they have been, um, a no, uh, now there is a change on the mindset of a, very, a lot of hospitals, a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, in healthcare professionals, medical doctors, that before that they wouldn't ever use uh, WhatsApp to talk to patients or Zoom to talk to patients. And now more than a half of them will use and are using these kind of channels to, to, to talk to patients. So uh, it's not only in the demand side, the supply side also have been obligated to, to use this on all the around the world, not only in the emerging markets, in, in Spain, in Europe, in, in, for example, in Austria, in Austria, uh, three months ago, Telemedicine was prohibited. It wasn't, you were unable to do telemedicine in Austria. It was not regulated, it was prohibited, forbidden. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and it has to change. A regulation has been very, uh, has been changing the last weeks a lot in a lot of countries. And I would also like to mention that telemedicine, we have been talking about telemedicine, I don't know, mm -hmm. 20 years, 30 years about telemedicine. And Always this because of also United States and the regulation of the United States, telemedicine is always associated or linked to a video conference. Mm -hmm. And in the emerging mar markets or, or the rest of the markets, it's not video conference, it's WhatsApp, mm -hmm. it's WeChat. The most important, the biggest healthcare company today in the world is, is WhatsApp. They are doing mu much more medical consultations than, for example, Telaloc or Pingangu Doctors. Oh. So this is something that people normally do, uh, don't uh, don't catch uh, uh, don't catch about telemedicine. Telemedicine it's not 
video conferencing with a doctor. It's communicating it's a... remotely with a doctor and it's changing the paradigm because uh, a video conference is something that is very similar than a typical face-to-face -face visit. An instant messaging communication with your doctor, it's, it's an asynchronous communication. It doesn't, it, it's another thing and mm -hmm. it's much more efficient. So we are seeing a lot of WhatsApp related. I've seen a lot of new WhatsApp uh, healthcare uh, communication that are in, that are uh, having a lot of more success on, mm -hmm. the, than the typical video conference that everybody has talked about before. Mm -hmm. Well, and we're all on video conference almost uh, eight, you know, eight or nine hours a day at this point. So it's becoming more natural. You know, all jokes aside, it is starting to get integrated and more comfortable in our daily lives. And you know, Noble, I want to come to you next on this and kind of seeing your opinion on what's what's happened in the past six months that's really impacted this to accelerate so forward and uh, gary brian i'm going to come to you afterwards as well and get your opinions before we we go further yeah i mean it, it's um my we I, I was part of a project that worked on telemedicine remotely uh, about mm -hmm. almost 10 years ago in hawaii because in the main island uh it's very difficult for people in the more rural islands to just interact and even get the healthcare they need. And so the idea of telemedicine has been around for, you know, 30 years, it's been around for quite some time and video conference. HIPAA laws still are, are still an issue in the United States in order for it to be truly effective in, in, in maintaining people's privacies. But I think we're getting there. And um, it's, it's kind of unique because telemedicine, as we're talking, we're talking about WhatsApp, but even in the AR VR space, uh, you know, you have Proximity, which is actually taking uh, skilled surgeons and you're using virtual reality via quote unquote telemedicine slash VR slash, you know, everything else and smash it all together to get help surgeons in other parts of the world be able to perform uh, cutting edge techniques and, and, and technology. So it's not just telemedicine on the retailer supply, supply customer side, but it's telemedicine for expertise. You know, there's just a lack of expertise globally. And I think that in the last six months, uh, proximity is, is, is exploded, to be frank, because people are starting to realize that it's important to start interacting and uh, sharing the skill sets across the globe so that they can provide the best care. You know, we've seen so many in, uh, skilled and capable doctors sidelined because of COVID being either forced quarantine or self quarantine and something like proximity is allowing them to share the expertise with other doctors. So it's been a, a broad swath that the whole concept of telemedicine is happening along is not just for the, for the end user, but it's for peer to peer relationships as well. So we, the last six months have been, uh, I think a, a boon for where I think the overall uh, idea of the technology is headed. Uh, at the end of the day, and, and we've talked about this before, uh, Kyle, it, it, the, the rules and regulations have got to catch up in, in a big way. And the idea of uh, blockchain <laughs> has to be instituted in people's individual uh, uh, health records so that they can actually own it and be portable in how they interact with their doctors. And then the tracking of information. It's great that WhatsApp is the number one medical uh, communication device, but then how do you track all that data and, and then where does it go and who stores it and who keeps it? So there's a lot, still a lot of uh, intersections where the technology is starting to get further and faster than even the capability. You know, I, I've got four different uh, cloud drives, right? So mm -hmm. four different cloud drives with different photos and different. So how does that, how do you maintain all your health data across multiple streams and multiple interactions? And so, you know, a, you know, and just to kind of proceed Gary a little bit, this is where, and, and, and Gary's talked about it, AI is important. You know, this is, mm -hmm. this is where we have to start doing a full integration and give people uh, a regulatory tool set that allows this to become the norm. And in and and, and this last six months, we're making the questions uh, pop up. Mm -hmm. Well, and not just get popped up too, right? Get answers. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, the time of questions and can more questions and more questions and more questions is over. It's it's time to start acting. And I, I think you're you're right on that. And to Gary, to you, I mean, Noble teed you up. You know, AI's role in this plays a huge, huge part. And Brian, we're coming to you next. Um, you know, Gary, further in that conversation and, and this thoughts, 
where does AI play a role in all of this? I mean, how do you see the fact, past six months? Well, so over the past six months, I mean, this has really followed the trend of the digital transformation. Mm -hmm. The difference is when people are dying or people are afraid of dying, things change quickly. So you saw some of the missteps with like hydrochloroquine uh, and some of the things that happened with that. But on the other side of it, look at all the way ways that we've been able to start looking at drugs more effectively. I just read right. yesterday that Russia came up with a maybe vaccine, some type of vaccine for coronavirus. But I'm really happy, as Noble said, that we're now doing cross-border uh, telemedicine because you're right, having the best person, the best doctor, the best place to be able to diagnose a, a disease or disorder is fantastic. Now, the systems that need to be used to be able to back that up and to be able to synthesize the incredible amount of data that's going to be out there, I mean, that's where the AI starts to come in. So neural networks and artificial intelligence to be able to extract all that data. The good news is it's happening and it's happening now. And I'm, in a sense, I'm happy that we've gone down through this digital transformation with medicine. Look at the issues we have in front of us today. I did a project at Stanford about four years ago. <clears throat> I took my uh, MBA students there. I wanted to have some fun with some students for the summer. So I worked on a project living to 120 with uh, Stanford University and my MBA students. And so we were really diving deep into it. And I think we have so many opportunities to dramatically increase the quality and the length of our life and having the technologies, the artificial intelligence, the telemedicine, which is coming. You're right. HIPAA laws aren't there yet, but guess what? They're more willing to change now than they were six months ago. So we got the wins behind us. What we have to do is take advantage of those wins. And the, this, why well, just the Stanford opportunity where they've taken artificial intelligence and used it on melanoma. And they said it was better than like 23 doctors, 24 doctors being able to tell if it's melanoma, right? With artificial intelligence. Those are the kind of technologies we need. Nanobox to be able to go into your system, to be able to clean the cholesterol out, to be able to repair, to be able to alert. Those kind of technologies are coming. I mean, we're not that far away. It's, you know, uh, step by step. So I'm really excited. This is the best time that I've ever seen for medicine and telemedicine there's ever been, you know, and it's an exciting time because the handcuffs are taken off and, and docs are allowed to do things that they weren't allowed to do before. And the FDA is speeding up, you know, understands that there's some urgency in terms of speeding up the cycle to get things approved. And embracing it as well. And Brian to that, you know, continuing the conversation of, you know, what's what's happened, really, what was the impact of, you know, the last six months have on bio and med tech? And I know you've got a lot of experience in this as well. And we've talked a little bit about the areas of food and other technologies of how this plays a role. But we'd love to hear your continued opinion on what really has been impacted and what does that mean uh, for these industries right now? And you're on mute. There you go. Uh, well, hi, everyone. Uh, really great to be part of this conversation. Um, my major investment and research area is not uh, med tech, although because food and health touch on each other in so many ways, we look at um, a lot of supplement companies, sort of nutrition platforms, uh, and all sorts of back-end technology that helps everyone from grocers to CPG companies like Mondelez and General Mills make health-related decisions for the foods they're producing and selling. Uh, I mean, I think, as everyone said, it's a very exciting time. There's these incredible tailwinds. Uh, I mean, two quick examples that come to mind for me out of the New York City health tech ecosystem are Parsley Health, which is sort of a, um, sort of a more affordable concierge doctor service, 100% online. And one thing that being digital first allowed them to do was quickly you know, test it in New York City then launch in five other American cities, and then very quickly basically be able to offer their services to any patient anywhere. Uh, it depends heavily on testing. It depends heavily on digital therapeutics. It depends heavily on you know, bots and telemedicine technologies that can help triage situations and save money all around. 
Um, so, so I know they've had some success. They just re, uh, they just raised a Series B or Series C at a fairly high valuation, and and they're just a good example, I guess, of the growth in this area. What I will quickly say on food and agribusiness is, you know, just like you said, WhatsApp is the major health tech platform on the planet. A lot of farmers say Instagram is now their best extension agent. So you've got a problem with a machine or a plant, you take a picture and you post it for all your friends to look at. Um, and so what that means is companies like Grow Intelligence um, or Farmer Business Network, which are already doing, you know, connecting farmers digitally, they're going to be the best, uh, you know, they're going to be in a position to help with plant disease problems, uh, you know, spotting them early by analyzing sort of global crop and weather data, knowing when the locust swarm is moving across Africa or corn earworm is, is moving in the Midwest. Um, but also animal medicine is quickly moving into digital therapeutics, uh, implantables. I would say probably animals are even ahead of us in terms of implantables and nanotech. Uh, there, you know, there are smart devices that are being put into the guts of a dairy cow, and it can give you a sense of what's happening with the entire herd's use of feed and efficiency. So, I mean, it's exciting because we're really very early. I think regulations are starting to change to be more open to this. Um, and, and just what we're seeing in the food world, again, is anyone who's not able to interact digitally and be digital first is at a dis disadvantage right now. Mm -hmm. And we, we talked about this around a number of technologies, how things are not built in a day, they take time. And the common theme thus far from everyone has been, we're, we're in the early, but the good early times. Uh, Brian, I wanna to come to you first on this is, um, you know, while we may be early, uh, you know, what does that mean in, in the sense of, is this stuff that things we're talking about like nanobots or, you know, potentially uh, personalized foods or, um, some of the other things that we've discussed here around uh, this topic, is that coming in the next five years? Or is this something that we're still 10, 20 plus years off uh, for us as humans? I mean, you bring up the example of animals having, you know, some, some uh, nanobots, for instance, in their stomachs. How far off are we from having that type of technology uh, in ourselves? And, and then Noble, I'll come to you right afterwards. Uh, and Brian, you're on mute. Yeah. There you go. Uh, you know, I don't know the answer on the human side. I would defer to my colleagues here. On the animal science side, you know, they're experimenting. It's happening on lots of levels. The first CRISPR cow was born recently. So, you know, agriculture is definitely a testing ground for a lot of these cutting edge biotech technologies. It has been since the 1980s. Um, um, I, you know, I think the really exciting stuff for me, and this is not exactly answering your question, um, you know, are taking analog devices and making them smart with the use of sensors and internet of things. That's starting to happen in agriculture, placing moisture sensors throughout vast fields uh, to save water. Those sorts of things are happening. Um, I think there's also a lot of innovation, I will say, and this does touch on biotech and medtech. You know, we're, we're sort of saying what's going to replace pesticides and other sort of, you know, first generation conventional agricultural chemicals. And what are you seeing? You're seeing biologicals, which are basically microbes, funguses, uh, beneficial pathogens that are being cultured mm -hmm. using biotech, using fermentation, and having farmers spray that instead of spraying pesticides, herbicides, et cetera. So that's a big shift happening, very all of a sudden happening, because even though regulations are falling away, the, the, the tailwinds for sustainability and reducing toxins in the environment, I don't think there's any going back from that. So that's exciting because that definitely touches on human medicine um, and sort of, I don't know what you would call a more integrated or natural-ish approach, um, you know, sort of getting away from synthetic chemicals and more towards, you know, moving biological systems. Um, right. that's, that's kind of what I see uh, again in, in the sort of, especially the next gen agrochemical companies that I'm looking at. No, it makes perfect sense. Noble, I know you, and it sounded like Gary had a point as well, and, and then we'll come around, but go ahead, Noble. Yeah, I mean, it, Brian kind of teed it up really well. He was talking about uh, the different uh, uh, soil sensors for water and, and, and how sensors are being used. And so for us, we've always looked at uh, what's called the e-textile segment, and whereas the, the clothing itself goes one step beyond. Fitbit kind of began the stage of us monitoring individuals, but we've looked at a lot of different really cool uh, 
Uh, and again, and it's kind of funny because this intersects with gaming. So they have something called haptic clothing in which if something happens in the video game, it impacts or you feel what's happening directly to yourself. Well, a lot of that is starting to be integrated into medical technology or med tech for e-textile clothing in which they are now looking at sensors that make sure that someone doesn't get uh, bed sores that they're putting in beds uh, since we're having an older and aging population. So, you know, there goes the, the moisture sensors. They're working on soft robots to help people who are frail and allowing them to be able to move and pick up items where they would normally fall over. And so for me, the idea of the whole e-textile movement has become very uh, exciting because this idea of the haptic clothing, which is biofeedback, feeds more so into a world in which telemedicine becomes is becoming normative, where people are interacting and dealing with their doctors. And so the idea of all these people with these current chronic diseases, such as diabetes, uh, chronic heart conditions, kidney, uh, the, there, there's so much uh, that can be conveyed on a consistent basis just in having the right clothing or shirt or the like that then relays that information back. And so it's, it's exciting on that level, 100% that sensors and clothing are not about to come, but are actually here. There's one company, uh, I think called the Demo Plus. They actually have a, a, a washable sock that will monitor people and see if their legs swell or don't swell and refeed that information back. So their doctors know if they're in, uh, in distress or something's wrong. And they've done a successful raise and they're going to their next level of raises. And so there's a lot of great things in, in that space that are leading. But even more fundamentally, you know, we're, we're, you're talking about 20, 30 years right now. They've been using virtual reality for about three different effects. Number one, they use virtual reality to reduce pain medication. So they're utilizing it as an analgesic effect to help people who either have chronic pain or are dealing with some acute pain to diminish the amount of drugs they have to administer to them. So this is a real exciting form for VR, but then they've taken another step further. They've used it to help kids who have autism and have been testing it out in being able to normalize those children and, and make them feel more comfortable in their regular world to deal with a lot of the anxiety issues that drive autism. And then they've actually used virtual reality pretty successfully for veterans who have PTSD. And this is all happening right now. And there's a swath mm -hmm. of companies that are integrating both haptic technology and virtual reality. So the, the next phase of implementation is already here. So the next phase of going to um, micro, micro, microtizing it and going nano, I think is really right around the corner. It's probably a couple of years away. If they're already applying the technology in animals and we're utilizing the base technology on people norm, uh, in regular life now, it, the, the biggest issue that a lot of people have concerns about med tech is the HIPAA violations that we talked about and the amount of investment prior to six months ago that they're going to make in it. Now the investments are starting to come and it's going to be an explosion. The next five years, we're going to have a whole different med tech landscape. It's going to be awesome. And I, I see everyone shaking their heads, but um, Gary, I, I want to get your opinion. And then Justin, I got a big question for you. So get ready. Go ahead, Gary. Well, I mean, one thing we've overlooked is the um, aging in place, the elder population. Look at a number of folks today that are age 65 and above. It's like 46 million. I mean, this is a global problem. <clears throat> and we really haven't addressed it. I don't know how many of you have ever been in a nursing home, but I know with my father, when we went in, I could not believe for $14,000 a month how disgusting it was. It was not quality of care. They had at this particular home, they had a circle and they were watching Leave It to Beaver and they were like in a half circles. I've never seen anything like it in my life. And, uh, you know, I'm also a clinical psychologist, so I've seen a lot of stuff in my life, but n this was right at the top. And so anyhow, it was four years ago and I actually took my father's house and I redid his house and I rigged it up with sensors and cameras and actually started, you know, I'm in AI, so I actually started a system. And we've actually now developed, a, it's an aging in place uh, tool. Because I said, this is, this is disgusting, right? And I, you know, people are located all over the world. You want to know what's happening with your parents. You want to be able to monitor them, things like sleep patterns, isolation monitoring, mo movement detection, et cetera. You want to know what's going on with them. Not just visually with a the camera, but you want to know. So I think we've really not 
that area for me, that's really close to the heart. And I think we need to look at those kind of things to enhance the quality of life. You know, the it's, it's proven from a, a psychological perspective that if you bring somebody home and take them out of the nursing home, bring them back home, they live a lot longer, right? Because the will to live as Gil would know is critically important for patients to survive. My father lasted another three years after they said he was going to die in a week. Once I, you know, got him home and and set him up and and uh, you know enhanced his quality of life. So I'm really focused on that. I think we need to look at it's not just the telemedicine. It's how do we take care? How do we take the artificial intelligence? How do we take sensors and apply it to critical problems? You know, sometimes we we uh, sweep it under the rug, but it's going to hit all of us and we need to do something about it. So anyhow, I worked, I found a Stanford MBA and we actually created a company called Zemply. And I'm not trying to plug the company. I'm just passionate about it because I went through it myself and it really, really helps. So that company's, uh, you know, in a year and a half has grown like crazy because we're in a special area that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And the way these nursing home works, by the way, I don't know how many of you have gone through this. They charge you up front five years of $14,000 a month, one lump sum. It's crazy. How do you know how long you're going to live, you know? Yeah, it's it's a wild industry, something that definitely needs to be re-looked at. And I think some of the technologies we're talking about definitely play a role. But, you know, bringing it back full circle around bio and med tech uh, uh, a little bit uh, further you know, Justin, I want to come to you around blockchain and, and, and maybe crypto, but let's let's focus on blockchain as, as Noble brought that up uh, around HIPAA. How does blockchain play a role in these two industries? Um, there's a lot of projects that have been talked about. There's a lot of tease, I'll say, around how this technology plays a role in the infrastructure. But where is this really happening? How have you seen this technology play a significant role in biomed and to Brian's point, health and a little bit of food ag tech. So all of these areas, we'll just call it health tech. How do you see blockchain playing a role in that? I'll make yeah, it easy for you. Health that tech. is <laughs> that is such a trillion dollar question. Like we've been trying to figure this out for a long time. You know, since like before Litecoin, it was people were talking about this before people. There was a concept of blockchain. Um, there's a there's what feels like a very, very natural fit for this as far as data provenance um, and data provenance in any sort of way, um, whether that's just ensuring that your records weren't tampered with, like your hospital records, um, whether that is supply chain, where does your medicine coming from, where is that working through um did a warehouse get too hot at some point? And there's some cool intersections around like IoT um, and AI and blockchain as the data set. And so people are really looking at like blockchain just really maintaining a really, a really consistent and a really solid data layer for this, um, which is good. You know, I, I think it's gonna be useful and helpful. Um, I'm a little bit concerned, and maybe it's not as overhyped now as it was, but I think it was certainly overhyped and oversold, where, you know, even though you can definitely prove that the data wasn't tampered with, it's still absolutely a garbage in, garbage out situation. There's still cause for people to try to commit fraud on all kinds of levels. Um, it's still a human probably putting in that, like, I received four pallets of this drug at this time. Um, and so we can start to reduce the sources of error, but there is still gonna be sources of error just because it's a natural chaotic system. It will kind of solidify and harden the data set as it goes, um, but we still have to be just as cognizant of the fact that this is messy data. Like it's not perfect data. Um, you know, all the AI work that I've done, um, everybody jokes about like machine learning, data science, all that is 99% just cleaning your data. Um, the actual running the models, like running, training the models, doing the analysis of the model is very, very small. It's all about getting data cleaner. Um, so data cleaning is its own problem. Once that is um, solved better, then we can use blockchain to really leverage the fact that we can be sure that that data is staying um, in place and intact. Um, I've been waiting to see 
more folks do more with it. What I think is going to be really cool and um, and and the kind of around like the health tech and food in general. Um, so we've kind of gone into this and we're starting a farm. Like we we have a few acres here in Austin and we've been starting to grow all kinds of our own food. We're like, that's fun. Let's scale it up. So we've got a hundred acres that we're buying right now to help support a lot of other people. And so it's like, how do I prove to people that the supply chain of this chicken that I'm giving them is, you know, it's clean or whatever. But really what we want to do is like, I'm going to be like, I grew this chicken. I can show you on a blockchain like that I moved it around the yard for uh, you know a few weeks and then I killed the chicken and I'm handing you the chicken. So the provenance chain is that I touched your chicken. Um, and so th that can be very effective. So I think that there's like blockchain will be helpful where you can have like very, very tight vertical coupling in supply chains. Um, I think it still becomes very, very hard when it's like transitioning like company to company to company within a supply chain because they all speak different languages. But if you wanna have like a very detailed record of something within some kind of a vertical stack, whether that's within one farm, whether that's within um, say Merck, like I was working on a project with Merck um, to do their, supply chain stuff, you know, they've got enough moving parts within the one IT department that it's actually feasible to try to get everything kind of into the same schema. And then you can blockchainify and then you can do AI on that and it's a lot better. Um, but it, it is this function of like the blockchain will be more helpful um, in places where you can see a very tight um, like vertical supply chain. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's interesting. And with that being said, and Noble, I know you have a point, but I want to switch gears real quick as we, we are investors. We have made investments. We look at investments, spend a lot of time in this space, whether it be bio, med, health, food, et cetera, uh, and their underlining technology. So I want to switch gears to, to the, for the audience on our perspective as investors. You know, what do we see as both the opportunities and then uh, from the diligence side? Because these companies in these spaces require, I think, a, a different type of level of diligence um, than to call it the typical SaaS company and just to use a easy relationship, not that they're, they're all the same. Um, but uh, William, I want to start with you. I mean, looking from your experience, um, from the, the idea of diligence, you know, what is this diligence process like um, looking at a bio or med tech company and how is it maybe different or what are key things you look for in diligence um, when looking at companies in the space? And you're on mute. Um, specifically in the space of health tech, uh, I would say that for me, it's not only about regulation, it's about uh, um, in the health tech market, there is um, very important to be able to sell there you have a very uh, a very consolidated market with a huge co huge companies that operate this market health insurance companies huge providers so what i what i look for and the best and biggest health tech, health tech companies that uh, today are really uh, in the billion in a billion valuations all of them uh, work very well with this kind of companies in terms of telemedicine like teladoc uh, and, and some of them are very, um, you don't know about them. For example, Advanced Medical was a Spanish company, was sold to Teladoc for 300 million. Nobody knew about them. It was a wide label company for telehealth. So for me, it's very important for these companies to be really, uh, they really understand the market and they are able to sell and convince these kind of companies because it's very important, I, I, and I myself have the same, the same problem with my companies. It's very important to disrupt this kind of uh, markets if you don't work uh, uh, and, and you don't work with these companies, you are not able to sell to these big uh, companies. Other thing that I've seen, not only in the health tech sector, but uh, in the mindset of, because I invested in all the companies and I, and I, I did a, a lot of due diligence, I work with a lot of venture capitals, there has been a change in a uh, uh, post COVID crisis. I've seen a lot of venture capitals that are very revenue based in terms of mindset. They want to see traction that is revenue based. It, it's one of the most important factors for, I, I, especially in Europe. I don't know in the United States. Also, what I've seen is that now there is also high, uh, another hype 
of about digital remote uh, mm -hmm. marketplaces like our comparators uh, native digital brands that for a long while weren't so attractive but because of coronavirus they increased a lot the their revenue so i've seen some kind of venture capital special in europe they are trying to uh, invest in companies that they won't fail in one year mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because it's some this in certain market today it's like i know that these guys are selling and it will uh, they will go to send they are digital so there is not a problem about coronavirus because they're selling quite more more today than four months ago right and this is what i've seen today and, and Brian, I see you shaking your head. What else do you have to add around the diligence process that you're seeing at these uh, these companies as well? I'm sorry, I was shaking my head about something else, but- um, Oh, you know, I called you out about it. So you, you still got to answer. <laughs> um, I, mean, uh, I mean, I guess the really interesting thing worth mentioning is that we're seeing deals close without ever meeting, without a face-to-face -face handshake, without getting in a room and seeing body language and team chemistry. I know some large funds are not doing that, but I think most people are moving in that direction. Um, you know, I, I think it all comes back to, you know, we've shown in these special times over the last few months that behaviors that were exceptional are now becoming more normal. Maybe if you had a choice between a face-to-face -face conversation and a Zoom call, you would have always done the face-to-face, -face, but since that choice is not so easy, you know, the Zoom is perfect. Um, mm -hmm. And, so I, I think we have to kind of in our diligence think a little bit outside the box and what we're telling food companies is the products that are working really well during stay at home need to be your first products for the future and then build on that rather than go back to what you were doing before. Um, and, and I think be flexible with the diligence um, in terms of feeling like, you know, these markets are still very early and, and they are evolving rapidly. Mm -hmm. Noble, real quick uh, on, on that same topic, you know, we talked a little bit about telemedicine in the AR VR space. What do you uh, what do you see our, from a, in a, a space on the diligence side around that? Yeah, so so my diligence and our diligence was a little bit different because we started off and we saw the use case in gaming. Uh, initially, we saw a pathway to profit immediately, uh, mm -hmm. and for us, it was about repurposing and redesigning the technology for medtech. In, mm -hmm. in a way that made logical sense. Uh, the, the only other caveat to that was also how can we get to the consumer without having to deal with the full-blown, you know, layer after layer that occurs in most medical institutions to adopt new projects. Uh, insurance companies and hospitals and most often B2B solutions are multi-year uh, implementations. And so our focus mm -hmm. has been really more on products that we know can evolve into a SaaS model like you brought up and or be a direct product that's sold uh, either directly and or utilizing uh, crowdfunding platforms to get the excitement for it. So for us, our diligence has been a, a little bit different than maybe traditional just because we, we just grew out of a different space when we decided to pivot in that or just add that direction to our, our, our current mm -hmm. holdings. That's a good point. And guys, we're coming to the lightning round. What does that mean on, on the show? If you're tuning in for the first time, we've got two or three quick rapid fire questions for our investors to get you the last piece of advice that you need if you're looking at this industry before we come to our closing thoughts and wrap up so you can figure out where to find all of us if you haven't already. With that being said, uh, I wanna jump into our very first question and that's around opportunity. So quickly, I would like to hear from each of you an area of opportunity or uh, areas of opportunity you see for both investors and founders to start building in around these areas. Again bio, med, health, and I'll throw in a little bit of food tech for Brian down there as well. But where do you see opportunities for investors to start investing and being cautious of or, or mindful of, and then opportunities for founders to start building? William, let's start with you. Quick answer. Where do you see the opportunities uh, for investors and founders in, in these areas today? And you're on mute. Yeah, I know. Um, this is what I, what I invested in the last days. It's in remote work. It's uh, and also um, I would say uh, I like a lot uh, the verticals of uh, of the typical in some messaging communication or imaging communication. Typical vertical from a sector from a, in the health tech, but also in food on other on, on 
other uh, verticals from the typical WhatsApp. I like them a lot because I think that in terms of efficiency of communication, only with mailing and video conference, it's not. Uh, we we can we can we can improve a lot in this kind of verticals with communicating communicating in the same market in the same sector. Mm -hmm. Perfect, Justin. I think um, there's a lot of opportunity around more distributed and decentralized food production um, and sourcing. I think that's going to be really fun to watch. We've seen a lot of problems with the food supply chains being a little bit fragile in the name of efficiency and just decentralize everything. I think it is kind of a good mindset and that's kind of a different one to look at. Decentralized everything, everybody. Uh, next up, before we get to getting shit done, uh, with Gary. Brian, to you, what are you seeing as areas of opportunity? Um, I like what was said before about wearables and implantables. And there's a new sleep related startup out of New York called Proper Sleep uh, that is just kind of, you know, realized, has recognized that sleep is a massive problem in America and beyond. And some really simple technology can go a long way to helping people track that sort of, you know, building on top of what Apple's already doing um, and, and gamifying it as Gary and others are saying, like uh, rather, um, uh, you know, as Noble and others are saying, uh, we're sort of interacting with our health data in new ways. And you want to set a goal for yourself. You want to get a personal best. And that, that, that's how you change behavior. And I, you know, I would just second what, what Justin is saying. We, you know, Almanac, the funds that I work for, we're all kind of, you know, of the post Michael Pollan era uh, where we're not willing to accept, you know, unhealthy, unsustainable food chains. We want to continually make it better and better. It sounds like there's lots of parallels in health as well. And it's nice to see that convergence. Absolutely noble. And then Gary will finish off with you. So noble uh, to you, sir. Yeah, yeah, no, it's funny, you know, let thy food be thy medicine, right? That's kind of mm -hmm. the core, and that's why it all ties in together. Uh, uh, for us, you know, our focus, and I, I really do believe in the convergence of uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, and, and the communications component, only because screens are going to disappear. People want to mm -hmm. feel like they're interacting with a human being, and, you know, the whole concept of the Uncanny Valley, uh, they're not going to really want to talk to just AI robots unless they really do look like people and really interact like people and so the idea of us communicating this way is going to slowly fast fast pass away from the screen so i always tell people focus on the, the next gen of the the virtual reality technology because here we've got people putting in uh, uh contact lenses so that you can digitally see your world and glasses being ubiquitous and so the easy ramp up points that intersect with med tech and, and and all of this is the idea that we will be in a screenless world uh within the next five years absolutely gary to you uh last point yeah sure so from my standpoint i i you know invested in um in aging in place so i i love that area because i think it's uh untapped uh, robotics and uh applied singularity you know how how we're going to merge together. We haven't talked about that a lot, but I think that's critically important for all of us. And um, longevity, you know, living longer. I mean, every, everybody wants to do it. It's uh, something that, that uh, everybody, uh, we should have a better quality of life. And that's one of the, when we did our study at Stanford, we understood that, you know, having a quality of life longer in life instead of suffering is really important. So how do we, accomplish that. I think that those are some areas that are really interesting. And then artificial intelligence and digital transformation, really through all this, what we've talked about is we've changed things a lot. And the digital transformation is here with us. Any types of technologies will make it more effective and efficient, better way to deal with docs, better way to get diagnosis are really important for us. So absolutely. Absolutely agree. And with that, we want to come to closing thoughts, uh, gentlemen, and appreciate all of your time today, but want to make sure everyone gets quick closing thoughts in and then also where uh, everyone can find you online, whether that be on a social network like we talked about on yesterday's show, so they can reach out, talk, continue the conversation and pitch, or uh, that may be at your respected funds and places of investment as well. So Gary, uh, you were last to finish. Let's have you be the first to start. Quick closing thoughts, anything else to add, and then where can everyone find you online? Yeah, so the, from my standpoint for the startups, remember the glass is half full and not half empty. 
you know, I've been through a lot of these downturns, you know, everybody, everyone I've been through, people said, oh, it's the worst. I mean, I've seen a lot of things, bubbles burst, et cetera. So keep your head up, keep focus, uh, get shit done and move forward and, and believe in your dreams, visualize and, and it'll come true. This is an opportunity of a lifetime for startups to really come out and embrace technology and move it forward. Absolutely noble. Yeah, you know, it's easy to reach, get a hold of me, uh, Noble Dracone at LinkedIn, and you can send a, a direct message to me on Twitter, at Dracone, which is just my last name. Uh, you know, we're, we have an accelerator that I'm tied with. I'm on the advisory board of uh, M Accelerator in Los Angeles. You know, reach out to reach out to us. If you're in those verticals that make sense in both AR and VR, and it can easily be implemented in both a direct product or a SaaS model, love to talk to you, love to see your deck, let it get your information. The reality is, I uh, everyone's been saying it, we're in a new reality. <laughs> and so with all the interactions and the new acquaintances I've made, like Kyle and Gary and, and the like, you know, we're, we're, we're just heading into a whole new direction. And uh, I'm happy for it. And I'm, I'm happy to, to, to meet new people and, and just interact because uh, even today, you know, I learned brand new things and, and I've been in commodities industry for 30 years and it's awesome hearing what's going on in agrotech and what's happening, how it's evolving. And so it's, it's just, it's a, just consistently and constantly stay in learning mode because now's not the time to curl up, you know, you not only be half full, but be completely, uh, what do they say, empty cupped in how you perceive and, and, and take in data right now uh, in the world. And that's how you'll be able to change and modify. I love it. Brian. Yeah, I would second all that. I would love to stay in touch with this group and anyone else. And, uh, you know, uh, not just, I mean, my primary area of focus is, is tech all along the food chain from the farm all the way to the consumer. Um, but really the business models that you see from, you know, the digital industry and biotech and SaaS, all that is now being kind of overlaid onto food in a new way that we haven't before. I mean, I just looked at a company that's doing AI for grocery stores to help make suggestions for people shopping online, you know, sort of before they've even chosen, you know, these kale chips or, you know, this nut butter that's being suggested for them. So, I mean, that's all just starting. Grocers are just one example of a very analog part of the food chain. Um, so I'm excited for this cross pollination, so to speak. And, and yes, you can find me, Brian Hall, while at LinkedIn um, and, and any other platform you use. Wonderful, Gwilliam. Yeah, of course. Uh, as um, for first, as in, uh, if you are an investor or partner and you want to work uh, in the telemedicine sector and you are interested in the telemedical sector, please contact me. Um, you can uh, you can look at me or look for me in LinkedIn. I will send an, uh, my my link uh, here in the in the chat. I'm very interested in talking with partners, also especially in working in the United States for entrepreneurs. Uh, I would say now is an, there is a, a, a huge opportunity uh, mm -hmm. because when markets are unstable, when things are doing uh, are wrong, it's always uh, disruption. When there is a crisis, always there is uh, always there is a new opportunity there, mm -hmm. better than when everything is fine. And also, I would say something that it's against the typical common sense. Regulation is not the most important thing. Not in, I, I, even in telemedicine, it's not the most important thing. Don't think that regulation will keep, will stop you from doing changes in telemedicine or in health tech on everyone. I think that uh, everyone always puts, always puts tele, uh, regulation as the biggest problem. I think it's user traction is uh, where the revenue is coming from and not about uh, regulation. Absolutely. And Justin, close us out. Where can everyone find you and any quick closing thoughts? Uh, sure. So I'm on LinkedIn. Um, easy to find there, Justin Litchfield. And so totally sweet on Twitter, um, which I don't tweet enough. Um, but, you know, kind of closing thoughts about the regulation. I think that this is a really fun time because the doors have been blown wide open. And so everything in this space, like we can start to feel like 
the crypto space like let's let's start to treat like a lot of our health like the land rush um, that I think it's really becoming apparent that it is you know don't be afraid to take risks um, the regulators will be forgiving as long as you're trying to do the right thing and and don't actually hurt people uh, but don't be afraid to experiment like go out and change things like try new models um, people are funding new models in ways that we hadn't seen in a long time so so take risks absolutely couldn't agree more uh, with all of our speakers today. Guys, again, thank you so very much for, for joining in uh, and making the time today on Thursday. Uh, we're happy to have you. And uh, to your audience, thank you for tuning in. If you like what you heard, click subscribe, give us a thumbs up. Again, please do reach out. Myself, Elena, Maria, the entire LA Token team, we'd love to hear from you, what we can improve. We'd love to have you on the show if you're an investor. If you're a startup, thank you, Brian and Gary. Justin as well. Thank you. If you're a startup and you'd like to speak with us, you'd like to pitch us, you'd like to come on the show and actually share your idea and company, reach out. We'd love to have you. Again, investors, come on, on the show, share what you have to think about and what you're seeing happen in today's markets, along with what's coming in the near future. And with that, a big shout out to Elena and to the entire LA Token team for making VCTV possible every day. And we'll be back here tomorrow in our big end of the week episode as we talk about what's happening everywhere in the world, in all different industries around venture and investment. Whether you're an investor or you're an entrepreneur, this is the episode to tune into so you can get your questions and your thoughts answered from some of the best minds like we have today in the world uh, as well. I, with that, I'm Kyle Ellicott, your host. You can find me on LinkedIn, Twitter, at Kyle Ellicott, and anywhere else on the interwebs. Uh, with that being said, I'll be back here tomorrow. Look forward to seeing each and every one of you on V